Today is an incredible day. It's a great day of celebration. It's great to be back together again. And can I just say that the church never shut down. Can we be clear about that? The church never shut down. The church is alive and well, and she was alive and well through lockdown as she ever has been. Having said that, we were unable to meet together, and I for one have missed that. And so today is worthy of celebrating because we are back together again. And in keeping with this celebratory theme, the message title today is simply this, Raise Your Praise. Raise your praise. We'll start a new series next week. But I thought, what could I share uh, as we gather back together for the first time in 15 weeks? And I thought it'd be good to do a message on praise. Everyone say praise. praise. Maybe you can write that in the comments. Praise with the praise hands. That'd be awesome. But uh, I want to just share with you from Psalm 68. Psalm 68 verses 3 to 4 says this. May the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy. Anyone happy in the room today? Happy? May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing praises to His Name. Extol Him who rides on the clouds. His Name is the Lord and rejoice before Him. Amen. Isn't that good news? You know, this Psalm not only encourages us, but it actually urges us to praise God. You see, praise is one of the most common themes in Scripture. Over 500 times the Bible references praise. In actual fact, there's no scriptural support for complaining against God. Isn't that amazing? We have to be reminded to praise God so many times and yet there's not one scriptural reference that endorses complaining against God. And yet, for whatever reason, we get into this cycle of complaining against God and forgetting to praise God. That's why this message is so important today. And uh, we are forever exhorted to praise the Lord. Hashtag PTL. We've got to praise the Lord. Those online might want to hashtag PTL. Praise the Lord for the young ones who don't know what that means. Okay, praise the Lord. What for? You might say, what, what have I got to praise God for? Well, let me just remind you, we can praise Him for His goodness. We can praise Him for His works. We can praise Him for His majesty. We can praise Him for His greatness. We can praise Him for His kindness. We can praise Him for His compassion, His love, His faithfulness, His protection, His provision, His salvation, His nature, His character, His beauty. It all deserves praise toward our incredible God. In actual fact, the Bible only gives one exception for us not to praise the Lord. Do you want to know what it is? If you're looking for a little out, here it is. Psalm 115 verse 17 says, It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise His holy Name. What is the one and only excuse not to praise the Lord? If you're dead... So what I want you to do right now is to, to check for your pulse. Just check for a pulse. If there is a beat there, then you have no excuse. If, if you're not, i got nothing for you. <laughs> so there's no excuse not to praise the Lord. And today I want to look at what praise is. And I want to give an example of how it looks, particularly in the life of Paul, who was an incredible apostle and wrote much of the New Testament. We did a series on the study of Philippians. That was a letter that Paul wrote. And he wrote it from prison, as we learnt a few weeks ago. And I want us to turn to the book of Acts chapter 16. And I want to look at this man's life and what he did in a less than favourable situation, a less than favourable circumstance, and what praise did for him and his buddy Silas. But before we read this morning, let, just, let me just give you a little bit of a backstory to what we're about to read. Because in Acts chapter 16, we see that Paul and Silas were in Philippi and they were on their way to pray. Everyone say pray. pray. And so there they were, they're about to pray and they were met by this cute little girl. That can seem like a nice thing. And this cute little girl came up to them and said this, these are servants of the Most High God showing you the way to be saved. So we've got a cute little girl who's speaking and preaching the truth. And you would think Paul would be happy. I mean, that's what we want our kids. We want our kids, we, as, as parents, we want them to grow up in the ways of God and proclaiming the ways of God. And here's this young girl proclaiming the ways of God. And yet she did it day after day after day after day. And Paul got just flat out sick and tired of it. I mean, it's crazy to me that this young girl who's spruiking the truth became an irritation to Paul. And I have to stop and ask myself, why is that? 
Why did she become such an irritation? She became such an irritation. He actually cast a demon out of this girl. Who would have thought this cute little girl preaching the truth could have a demon? Well, to me, it's interesting the fact that here's Paul in a new city. And what he's trying to do is build connection. And he's trying to build connection. So when he went to the temple, he would talk about Father Abraham. Because there was a connection with the people of God and they understood the Father Abraham. But when he went into new foreign cities, he would look for other ways to connect with people. And he didn't want this young girl telling them what they were there for before they had made the connection. In actual fact, this demonised girl was used by the devil uh, to actually become a distraction and to stop the connection that Paul needed in order to preach the truth. Because Paul never preached about Father Abraham when he went to Greece and when he went to some of the foreign cities because they didn't know uh, Father Abraham from Adam. They just didn't know the difference. And so he would look for other ways to connect. And he went to one city and he saw all these religious statues. And he says, wow, I see that you're a religious city. Connection, And I said, yeah. He said, how would you like to, me to tell you about a God that you don't have a statue for? And they became all ears because he had an incredible way of connecting with people. The Gospel is important, but in order for the Gospel to go forth, we need to make that connection. And this young girl was actually playing the card of what they were there for before the connection had been made. And so he got so frustrated and he uh, 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 saw this young girl uh, exercised from this demon and uh, there she was, powerless, to create wealth for her owner. See, this young girl was used by her owner to tell people's fortune, but now she'd lost that ability. And the owner got really upset and mad with Paul and Silas. So much so, they stirred up a bit of a riot. They got put in prison. And before they got put in prison, they were beaten with rods and they were cast into a prison and put in chains. And this is where we pick up the story right now. Acts chapter 16, verse 22 says this. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into a prison and the jailer commanded them to guard them carefully. When they had received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, everyone say midnight. Midnight. Paul and Silas, get this, were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't this an amazing portion of Scripture? Here's the jailer asking what they must do to be saved and he hasn't even preached Jesus yet. In contrast to this young girl who was giving away way too much before a connection was made. And uh, so Paul... Uh, was used mightily by God, but we're talking about praise this morning. And uh, I want to look at seven things that we can learn from Paul and Silas's life about praise. For some of you, it's going to be a reminder, but that's a good thing. For some of you, it may be new. But I trust and pray that when we leave this place today, we'll have a greater desire and understanding of what it is to praise God. Amen. You ready for this? Fantastic. Number one, praise is an act of our will. Praise is an act of our will. In other words, praise is not a gift. Praise is not a personality trait. Praise is not a feeling. It is a decision. It's a choice. And Paul and Silas decided to lift their voice to God in spite of their circumstance, in spite of their situation. They made a choice. In Psalm 145, verse 1, it says, uh, I will ex- exalt you, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'll say that again. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. In other words, when it comes to praise, you either will or you won't. There's nothing in between. You either will or you won't. And David says, I will. Paul said, I will. Silas said, I will. The question this morning is, what will you do? Or what won't you do? I trust I am in a room today where we said, we will extol and exalt the Name of the Lord because He is worthy. I will. Everyone say, I will. I will. will. Fantastic. Number two, 
praise is unconditional. In other words, it doesn't have conditions. It's not a matter of, I'll do that for you, God, if you do this for me. I think too many of us have this notion that if God does this for me, then I will do that for Him. I'll praise Him if He gives me a wife. I'll praise Him if He gives me a job. I'll praise Him if He gives me a promotion. I'll praise Him if He gives me the car or whatever the case may be. That's not how praise works. It's not based on conditions. It's not based on convenience. It's based on conviction. And Paul and Silas had a conviction that came from a a deep place. It wasn't convenient for them. And I've got to be honest with you, there are some days that it's easy to praise God. How many know what I'm talking about? Today is one of those days for me. To praise God with you today is not a chore for me. It's a joy, it's a privilege and it's an honour. For all those watching at home online, it's an honour to be with you online today. This is a joyful day. This is a day the Lord has made and I am fully glad But there are some days it's not as easy to praise God. Paul and Silas had one of those days. It wasn't as easy for them to praise God. And this is what the Bible calls the sacrifice of praise. You see, praise gains its greatest worth when it hurts the most. And the best time to praise God is when we least feel like it. Again, Psalm 145 and verse 2 says, Every day, everyone say every day. Every day I will praise you and exalt, extol your name forever and ever. And again, Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. Isn't this good news, church? Isn't this good news? Number three, praise involves our whole being. Our whole being. See, Paul's praise, I've already mentioned, came from a deep place. It came from a deep place. Psalm 103 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. In other words, praise is not merely mouthing words. It's like the Lord's Prayer. We have this incredible pattern. The disciples asked Jesus how they should pray and He gave them a pattern to follow. But that's become a mantra for some people. It's become something that we say with rhetoric. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And, and there's no inmost being yeah. when we're praying that. And there's, there's no passion, there's no heat. Habitual, careless cliches are not praise. Yeah. We need rich, lively, creative, fresh Praise. Psalm 33 verse 3 says, Sing to Him a new song and get this, play skillfully and shout for joy. I believe as a church, we should be singing new songs and I believe as a church, we should be doing it well. Gone are the days where we just sing old songs and we just sing them badly. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, getting on the uh, worship team at church was an excuse to play badly because God loves you. And God does love you, even with your bad guitar playing. But for everyone else's sake, let's Be skillful at what we do and how we play. And I want you to know, we have an incredibly skillful team and it doesn't just happen. They put in hours of work and we love you and we appreciate the skill that you bring every week. Come on, one more time. Let's show appreciation for our worship team. So good. Number four, praise is an expression of faith. See, Paul and Silas' faith was expressed through their praise. In other words, it's not a, well, Silas, it is what it is. Thank God Paul and Silas didn't have that is what it is attitude. As we learnt last week, faith is not an is what it is attitude. Faith is a, it isn't what it is. It isn't what it is because faith is seeing that which is not as though it were. In actual fact, faith is a time rebel. You know that. Faith takes a future event and drags it into the present. It drags it into the here and now. And we experience all that God has for us in the future right here, right now, even though nothing's changed because we know God is faithful and He is just. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. I know this to be true. My future is an eternity in heaven with Him and I can live in the reality of that in the here and now. 
I've got uh, hopefully some fruitful labour left here on planet Earth, but I know and I can live in the reality of that. One day I will see Him face to face. And in the darkest, most horrible times that I face or you face, we should have this hope and this faith that brings this future event into the present that gives us a peace and gives us a joy because that's what faith does. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says this, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. As I've been saying many times over the last few weeks, we don't rejoice in the circumstance, we rejoice in the Lord. Why don't we rejoice in the circumstances? Because they change. But we rejoice in God because He's the one constant in our life. He does not change. He's not like the shifting shadows. And if you are believing in God, you will rejoice in God. It's as simple as if you truly believe in Him and truly know Him, then we will rejoice in Him. I believe it is impossible to truly praise God and continue to doubt Him and His power. I believe faith follows praise and praise follows faith. So if you've got faith today, it should uh, 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 um, rise in praise. And when we praise, guess what? It's going to increase our faith. And when our faith increased, it increases our praise. And when our praise increases, it increases our faith. Praise follows faith as faith follows praise. It's like day follows night and night follows day. I believe that faith and praise are inseparable, much like thunder and lightning. Who believes that this morning? Yeah, maybe on home online there, you can just put a little lightning emoji. That'd be awesome. Number five, and I love this one. I love it. I love all the points, but I really love this one because praise creates its own environment. Praise creates its own environment. How many of you have ever heard this saying? You could cut the air with a knife. You walk into a place and you don't, you didn't see them fighting. You didn't see the plates being thrown. You didn't hear the words that were shared. But you walk in there and their best high. You know something happened. Because you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. How many know what I'm on about this morning? Maybe don't show me your hands, I won't look. (laughs) And that tells me something, that we have the power to change the atmosphere for good or for bad. If it's a principle that can work for good, it's the one that can work for bad and vice versa. And what we see with Paul and Silas is they they change their atmosphere. You know, instead of saying, woe is me, poor old me, Instead of sitting there thinking, I'm sore, I'm hurting. Why has this happened to me? This didn't happen to other Christians. No, they changed the environment with their praise. And I believe you and I can change the environment. I believe it's our responsibility to set the tone with our praise, wherever we may be. In our workplace, we have the opportunity to set the tone. Thomas Carlyle said this, he says, give me a man who sings at his work. Basically, that's the one I want to employ. And and I I feel kind of the same as a pastor. I want people who know how to sing. No matter what's going on in their world, just to sing. It's something we've taught our kids to do a lot of. You don't have to be a good singer. If you're anything like me, is there anyone who loves singing but it's not a good singer? Is anyone out there like, yep, me? Uh, But sing anyway. Sing nonetheless, because I believe it can change the atmosphere. You can bring life to dead places. You can bring life to the dead areas in your work. You can bring life to the dead areas in your school or your university. You can even bring life to that dead road that you might be on. You're worshipping this morning and everyone's like, everyone's like, yeah. And you're like, oh, I'll just just join them. No, 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 don't join them. Change it. Change it. You know, and hopefully what will happen, the person who's like this will go, oh, God. Start. Why not? Let's bring life to dead areas. And I believe praise can do that. Why? Because praise has the power to change the atmosphere. Number six is good. You're helpful. Number six, praise releases the power of God. And I love this. We read that the prison doors that were holding Paul and Silas and the other prisoners flew open. Not just Paul and Silas's, but all the prison doors flew open. And I have a theory about this. I have a theory. Okay, I have a theory. And for all you Bible scholars out there, just bear with me. But I think what took place that day was Paul and Silas were singing songs of praise. And God started listening and thought, wow, that sounds good. And as is the case, when good music is being played, you start tapping your foot. 
And I think God got so caught up in the moment and was enjoying it so much that He started tapping His foot harder and harder and harder. And all of a sudden, the earth started shaking and the prison doors just flew open. That's my theory. I haven't found a Bible scholar to agree with me yet, but that's my theory. But it makes sense. I mean, because that's, that's what good music does. And, and, and I believe when we will praise God, we open ourselves to the power of God. A Christian who is weak in praise will be weak in every area of their life. But a Christian that is strong in praise will be strong in every season of their life. We will face different seasons. We face our winters. We face our summers, our springs and our falls. We, we face different seasons. But I believe the one constant can be that we remain strong because we choose to praise God. And when we do that, a spiritual Lord comes into operation when we praise Him. And that is this, that God responds to our praises by granting us the strength we need for any given situation. You know, I do believe that God will prosper you. I do believe that there's a job out there. I do believe there are cars and I do believe there are finances. I believe in that. But I don't believe that that's what God wants for you on every occasion. But what I do believe that God wants for you on every occasion is to strengthen you in your season. And so sometimes the thing that's going to strengthen you is not the new car. It's not the thing that you're asking for. It's something else. So I would say when we're asking God for things, let's be open to the fact that God may answer it slightly differently than we are expecting. Because this I know, God wants to give you a strength for every season that we face. In Psalm 89, verse 15, it says, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. And in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favour our horn is exalted. Isn't that awesome? God wants to strengthen you. He wants to give you an energy. He wants to give you a passion. He wants to give you a joy that you did not think possible. And I believe that we open ourselves up to all those promises when we will praise God in spite of circumstance in spite of situation, if the band could come up and join me, that'd be just awesome. Point number seven. Some of you thought, there's no way. There's no way. Tony's going to get through seven points and here we are. Here we are. This is really a culmination for what we want to do tonight. We want to have a big praise party tonight. I believe tonight should be celebrated. In actual fact, when you look at uh, the very first chapter in the book, Genesis chapter one, we see this incredible pattern. And I think it'd be a pattern that we would all do well to actually embrace. And you see God working and celebrating. He said, let there be light, and there was. And he didn't get on with just working again. He stopped and said, it's good. It's good. And then he got up the next day, and, and, and he creates, and he says, let there be, and there was. And he said, it's good. It's an incredible pattern. It can't just be business as usual, church. We need to take some time out, a see that, just to say, hey, God, you've been so good to us. Because let's be honest, 15 weeks ago, we didn't know where we stood with COVID. We didn't know if we were going to be here in 15 weeks. Anyone like me thought, I didn't know if I were going to be here. We didn't know if we'd ever walk back in this building again. We didn't know. But here we are. And I think that moment is worth celebrating. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean we can't improve. It means it's good. And so we see this work, celebrate, work, celebrate for six days. And on the seventh day, God rests. What a, if we as believers could adopt this principle, work, celebrate, work, celebrate, and then rest. What a... What a beautiful pattern that would be for each and every one of us. Instead of work really hard, complain and whinge and get tired and bitter and cynical and then wake up the next day and do the same thing. And then on the day we should be resting, we're not, we just keep more working. I believe that through this COVID period, God has been speaking to us. And there's going to be changes for the good, not just for a season, but long term. Amen. Which brings me to point number seven, and that is this, praise is fitting. Praise is fitting. Psalm 33 verse 1 says this. Sing joyfully to the Lord. It says, it is fitting. Ever say fitting. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. We should praise Him simply because it's the right thing to do. We don't praise Him because we've received anything. Although can I remind you that He's given us salvation. Can I just remind you that He's given us the greatest gift of all and if He never gave us another thing, 
it would be enough. It's right. It's fitting. You know, when someone gives you something, it's right and fitting for you to say thank you. When you go and watch your son or your daughter play sport, it's right and fitting that you support them. It's not right and you and fitting for you to be there and not even watch their game. It's not right. And so it is when we come into the house of God, it's right and fitting that we praise Him. It's not right and fitting that we just sit on our phones looking through Instagram. It's wrong. Amen. It's right and fitting that we praise His holy name. And even if He doesn't answer our prayers, even in tragedy, even in loss, even in death, it's right and fitting that we praise His name. I'll never forget Naomi, who was very close to her dad. and He passed away a couple of years ago. And I'll never forget, he passed away on the Friday and you were here on the Sunday doing exactly what I'm talking about. In loss, in tragedy, yeah. praising and worshiping. And not just praising and worshiping God, leading us. Yeah. And we're not callous. We, we, we offered her a weekend off. We did. We just want you to know that. We did. We said, Look, <laughs> we said if you're not up to it. And she said, no, I'm up to it. And I'll never forget that morning because she smashed it. Yeah. Something of heaven came to earth. Yeah. When Naomi stood up here and opened her mouth, a little piece of heaven came into our auditorium and blessed many, many people. Why? Because praise is fitting. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what's happening in your world today, He should be praised because He's worthy. Praise is not something, and this 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 is something I want to share to get you thinking differently about praise. Praise is not something we have to do, please. Do not hear this message today, wherever you may be. Do not hear this as something, oh, I've got to do that now. As a Christian, I've got to do that now. Now, this is something we get to do. The fact that we get to praise the name of God, that we get to lift up His name is an incredible honour and incredible privilege. One of my favourite passages of Scripture is found in Hebrews, uh, sorry, Habakkuk, or some might say Habakkuk. (laughs) Depends where you're from, I suppose. (laughs) Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 says this, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, or I didn't get my promotion, or I didn't get my car, or I haven't yet got my husband, or I haven't yet got my wife, or the money didn't come through and I'm desperately after answers, yet. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord And I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go onto the heights. Amen. Who believes that this morning? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that this morning? Come on, let's stand right where you are. Let's stand right now because we're gonna put this message into practice this morning. Today is a day of celebration. Today is a day that we get to rejoice because God is good. He is faithful. And I want us right where we are to raise our praise. Come on.